So I have a goal of reading all of the Harvard classics in about the course of a year. If you don't know what the Harvard classics are, you can Google them. Um, but it's a book of, it's about 51 books. Um, well, there's books within books, 51 volumes, um, and more than that in books. And it's supposed to be, give you a wide breadth of a, a liberal education, a basic liberal education, at least as it would have been divided defined as it would have been defined by the president of Harvard back in the day, um, like a hundred years ago. Now, I'm in volume one, and I just finished the journal of John Woolman. John Woolman, in case you don't know, was a Quaker before the, before the Revolutionary War in colonial um, America. And he, um, and he was very influential in getting the Society of Friends or the Quakers to oppose slavery. So he, his main goal in life, like his motivating thing was to submit himself to the will of God. And he felt like God revealed to him that slavery and oppression are wrong. And as you read his journal, and as I've read his journal, it, it's fascinating. One, that he has such a, a real and a close relationship with God. He has a lot of revelations he communicates with god um and so he's kind of almost a prophetic figure but he has a line of communication with god and and that resonated with me in my religious tradition as a member of the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints we believe in a concept called personal revelation and um and john woolman demonstrates a lot of that um, this personal revelation this communication with god and that communication with God is what motivates him to oppose slavery. It also motivates him to do lots of other things. He opposes wearing dyed clothing. He opposes um, doing anything that might benefit a, um, the oppression of people or, or groups that oppress people. So, for example, he travels to England and he sees how um, the boys that deliver the post are treated and so he tells people to not send him any mail if they can help it, to avoid sending him any post if they can help it, um, because he feels that they're being mistreated, the boys who deliver the post. And he goes and he talks to people one-on-one -on -one and in these Quaker meetings um, to convince them against slavery. And he's one of the early abolitionists. Um, and... I really loved that this journal of John Woolman. I really, I, I felt like he was very much a man of God. That he, he was very respectful. Like the way that he persuaded people was very respectful, um, very persuasive, and motivated with love and fervency. And you can tell that it came from deep religious feeling. He wasn't trying to get power over the people. He wasn't trying to convince them so that he would be right. He was convincing them. He was trying to, to talk to them about that because he truly believed that it's what God wanted and the way that he acted showed that he acts in a way that he feels like God wants to. And he just traveled all around the United States of the, of the area. Not They were the United States then, but all around colonial America um, talking to other Quakers and persuading them to oppose slavery. And so he's a real... He's a real hero, and I really enjoyed reading his journal. Some of it was a bit of a slog to read, but but it had lots of really good parts. He has this great section here where he talks about um, arguments for slavery that and kind of why they're bogus, and I think he has very powerful good points. So, for example, he talks about the argument in favor of slavery that um, the conditions in Africa are bad, and therefore bringing them over to be slaves in the United States or in, in colonial America would be, is a better situation. And he says, don't, we, we aren't trying to improve their condition. Like that's not the goal of slavery is to improve their condition. And it's not really, let's see, I have the quote here. Um, um, okay. We manifest by our conduct that our views in purchasing them, so in purchasing slaves, are to advance ourselves. And while our buying captives taken in war animates those parties to push on the war and increase desolation among them. So he says, the slave trade increases war. So if you're worried about war in Africa, you would oppose the slave trade because it increases war. 
right? And our goal is to advance ourselves. And to say that they live unhappily in Africa is far from being an argument in our favor, right? So, I like he has that one. He has a good, um, the theological idea that slaves come from the seed of Cain through, um, through Ham's wife um, is a theological argument that I had, that I have heard. Um, it comes up in the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and some justifications for a ban on blacks receiving the priesthood um, that existed some time ago. And, um, and he does a good job of saying that doesn't make any sense. One, Cain's line would have been, um, would have been killed in the flood, Noah's flood. And, and, um, and also that there's scriptures that say that the son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, but everyone is answerable for their own sins. And so he's like, theologically, that just doesn't hold up. The idea that that it's okay to enslave people because they would be descendants from Cain uh, is just theological, not a theologically not okay for us to do. And so he had a he has very powerful arguments against slavery um, that I really really liked. Um, he he talks a lot about. Um, he details really well the, the, he has a powerful argument against slavery here that I'm going to read. He says, many of the white people in those provinces take little or no care of Negro marriages. And when Negroes marry after their own way, some make so little account of those marriages that the, the, with the views of outward interests, they often part men from their wives by selling them far asunder, which is common when estates are sold by executors at, Ven at Vendu. Many whose labor is heavy, being followed at their business in the field by a man with a whip hired for that purpose, have in common little else but to, but allow, allowed but one peck of Indian corn and some salt for one week and a few potatoes, the potatoes they commonly raise by their labor on the first day of the week. The correction ensuing on their disobedience to overseers or slothfulness in business is often very severe and sometimes desperate. Men and women have many times scarcely clothes sufficient to hide their nakedness, and boys and girls, 10 and 12 years old, are often quite naked amongst their master's children. Some of our society, and some of the society called New Lights, use some endeavors to instruct those they have in reading, but in common this is not only neglected but disapproved. These are the people by whose labor the other inhabitants are in great measure supported, and many of them in the luxuries of life. These are the people who have made no agreement to serve us, and who have not forfeited their liberty that we know of. These are the souls for whom Christ died, and for our conduct towards them we must answer before him who is no respecter of persons. They who know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he hath sent, and are thus acquainted with the merciful benevolent gospel spirit, will therein perceive that the indignation of God is kindled against oppression and cruelty, and in beholding the great distress of so numerous a people will find cause for mourning. So, I really like the Journal of John Woolman. I feel like it's a powerful um, testimony against slavery. And it was done before the United States was even independent from Great Britain. Um, it, it showed that people, even in colonial America, several people knew that slavery was wrong and were fighting against it and actively opposing it. And um, John Woolman's one of those people. Um, another thing, and I'm also really impressed with the way that he goes about his anti-slavery work. He's very respectful to people. He's even respectful to slave owners and people he disagrees with. He's extremely respectful. And he just goes and he persuades them with love and and with a desire to do what God wants him to do. Um, he describes a vision in which an angel tells him that John Woolman is dead and meaning that his own will is is dead. And you can tell that that's his his overarching idea, his motivating thing is to, is to let his own will die and to be replaced by God's will. He wants to serve God. And that's something that comes across in his writings and in his trying to um, undermine the institution of slavery and get rid of it. And, um, and he tries to undermine lots of other things too. As slavery is his most active thing that he, he works on. Um, he, he's a man that lives according to his principles, even though to some people 
those principles would be weird, and at that time perhaps opposition to slavery was weird. He also did lots of things that modern people would feel like is weird. He didn't believe in wearing clothes that were dyed. He avoided sending posts because the post boys, as I mentioned before, he avoided traveling to Barbados because he knew that the fare that he paid would enrich um, enrich people that oppressed other people, um, the shipholders. He avoided eating or drinking from vessels that were stained with worldly glory. <laughs> so, so if the vessel appeared to be rich, too rich, or, or like made of silver or something like that, he he didn't want to drink out of it. Um, yeah, and there's a quote where he, he listens to a sermon where the guy says that he wanted to be divert, devoted to the service of Christ so fully that he might spend might not spend one minute pleasing himself, that he's devoted so much to Christ that he he is not pleasing himself at all. And that's something that John Woolman aspired to. Um, and you can see it in his writings and in his life. And so, yeah, I was really impressed with the diary of John Woolman. I really liked that one.